Indian Ocean webinar. Um, and um, this Friday, um, it's a holiday here in the Gulf, but I'm very happy to have um, our three panelists. We have Malini Sur all the way from Sydney. It's late in the evening there. We have Vani Saraswati from Bangalore, and we have Abdul Rahman Varsami from Doha from Al Jazeera. Um, I'll just introduce um, the topic for today as well as um, our participants. Um, what we're talking about today um, is primarily the issue of mobility, which is sometimes um, glossed over as just migration, but really it is uh, a right to move around, to be mobile, um, you know, within your own country and beyond, uh, across borders, um, and in the Indian Ocean region, whether in the eastern part, extending up to Australia, and in the western part as well, um, where we are located in Doha, in the Gulf, um, there is a really a long millennia old um, history, a cosmopolitan history of, my, of mobility between South Asia and the Gulf, between the Gulf and the Horn of Africa. Um, in the past half a century or so, we've had various kinds of national borders and ethnic formations, um, which have complicated um, the politics of mobility um, in the Indian Ocean world. Um, we also have a new political economy of labor in the Gulf, as, as in Southeast Asia and other places, which were transformed during the era of the world wars, and at least in this part of the world, the discovery of oil and gas, hydrocarbons in the region. Um, now, the new prosperity, the new resources and the prosperity that's come out of it um, has, of course, created all kinds of opportunities uh, for migrants, old and new but it's also posed various challenges. Um, there are legal um, and other restrictions on uh, immigration, residency, citizenship, and of course these vary as laws vary across uh, countries. Um, and of course the, the, the interests of the host states and the sending states seem to um, uh, be is somewhat, somehow balanced, um, even though this seems to be more and more a bilateral matter rather than something that is uh, resolved at a kind of more global or international level. Um, the migrants or um, the various forms of mobile labor that you see in, in the Gulf and other parts of the Indian Ocean world um, perform a wide variety of work uh, activities, whether in homes, which is often neglected, on offices and factories, malls and restaurants, oil rigs, aircrafts, you name it, they're everywhere. It's really hard to think of a world um, in the Indian Ocean which is not about people go, move, leaving their homes um, to work in another place. Um, this is really um, something that is not just commonplace, but it is really some, a, a feature. I would say the various forms of mobility uh, have come to define the region, both in the past and also in the present. Now, the one last thing I want to say, of course, is that the arrival of COVID-19 uh, this year has really complicated um, the histories of mobility and the kind of the present day politics of mobility in the Indian Ocean. Um, it's created, of course, as in every other part of the world, it's created a set of economic hardships, um, but it's also prompted a, a kind of wider rethink on the economic value of migrants, um, particularly in a post hydrocarbon world. And this is something that I hope um, our panelists will be able to enlighten us more about. Um, so the first up, we'll, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll have the three panelists speak for about uh, five minutes or so, and then we can kind of, um, you know, respond to each other, so to speak, and, um, and then open it up later at the end for uh, Q&A with uh, web webinar attendees. So to introduce each speaker, I'll do it one by one. Um, we'll start with Malini. Uh, Sur, she is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society and also teaches anthropology at the University at Western Sydney University. She has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Amsterdam and um, her research focuses on three main lines of inquiry, agrarian borders, urban space and broadly on kind of the environment or the politics of the environment. And she has a new book coming out with UPenn Press. It's called Jungle Passports. And it deals with mobility and citizenship um, in the, uh, the borderlands between Northeast India and Bangladesh. So we'll go with Malini, you first. Udaya, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be in dialogue with uh, all, all, all the panelists here today. Uh, 
your provocation for thinking about what the present of the Indian Ocean world is and what might its future and its labor formations look like in a post-pandemic world is really a provocation that pushed me out of the swamps of Northeast India and the marshlands of Bangladesh and these kind of muddy land borderlands into a far broader horizon uh, of seas, of very rich hydrocarbon deposits and of historical mobilities and constraints. And very intimately tied to each of these questions is of course the times that we are living in now. What may we think about the Indian Ocean world if we were going to take the ethnographic present as a moment to reflect on the historical ties that has defined and redefined this region, the rich subterranean resources, the oil, the gas, and the other resources that has you know, defined this region as a region of strategic and trading importance. At the same time, how do we really reflect back on the older patterns of mobility? And here I'm thinking, for instance, about the movement of the cameleers from uh, British India, from Afghanistan, who traveled, you know, who were taken as indentured labor and who came to actually build the rail tracks of the deserts across Australia. They were the Afghan cameleers who came with their animals. And this was a completely difficult, uninhabited, uh, you know, inhabited by Aboriginal nations, but also a very difficult terrain in which that entire labor actually produced new infrastructures of mobility, but also new infrastructures of control because the Afghans really were ne never recognized as legitimate citizens, you know, in a white Australian nation. Now, to think again once more through the pandemic uh, and think about Australia in relationship to the Indian Ocean world, one of the major differences in the kind of labor mobility patterns in the o Indian Ocean region is what, what we may call a kind of a working class construction flow that moves from the Indian subcontinent, both to Singapore and to other parts of Southeast Asia, as well as to states in West Asia, right? We, we can think about how cities, you know, like Doha, like Dubai have literally been crafted out of the labor of, of construction workers coming from the subcontinent um, uh, and other places. Again, as you very correctly pointed out, we can think about the mobility of domestic workers who've traveled again across both these shows. And increasingly, there are domestic workers who are moving from Northeast India to Singapore to work inside residences. Now, if we look at Australia, you know, the construction industry, the mining industry, these have been very, very uh, rich industries and heavily protected industries. You don't really get to see the work, foreign workforce uh, moving in similar pathways to Australia in, in sectors that are highly paid even for construction laborers, right? Instead, what is that face of the Indian Ocean mobility in Australia? And what is that face that became very vulnerable and extremely, uh, you know, evident. It is the face of the ground Australian international student. You know, when we think about new regimes of mobility and new regimes of precarity, we have to think about this large supply of students who are coming to Australia and who are working in precisely the kind of unprotected, underpaid industries, hospitality, you know, cleaning services, etc. You know, trying to keep up their uh, uh, fees while working in these industries. And then we can think back about what happens during something like the COVID, you know, what, what then becomes the face of citizenship, of the kind of social security that uh, Australian students can get vis-a-vis -vis what international students don't get. And also we have to think about the different responses, for instance, of, you know, religious charities, diasporic charities in Australia kind of stepping up their game to meet uh, and to offer a more hospitable and a congenial environment for completely stranded uh, students, students who cannot continue to work in these sectors to pay for their semester fees. Now, this, this kind of a continuum on the one hand of, of different kinds of labor mobility 
and the kind of new forms that precarity takes, you know, fundamentally brings us to one question. What is it that COVID-19 is forcing us to think about this, this zone of interconnected ocean spaces and the kind of pockets of power that the nation states represent within it? And what might be its direction in the future? And here, you know, also because this region has been very strategically important, being a very massive naval, naval base for Australia and kind of, you know, a site where uh, the maximum number of container traffic happens uh, for, for Australia, you know, the kind of port city traffic that happens. I think it's very important and COVID-19 actually presents us the, not just a moment of, um, you know, severe public health crisis uh, scattered across the Indian Ocean region, but also the provocation to think about emerging possibilities of labor exchanges, uh, questions of identity and belonging. And I think I'm going to stop here. So your provocation in a sense, you know, kind of pushed me to think about uh, uh, a region through its um, trading and other par parameters, and also to think about the distinct kind of labor, labor formations that uh, the Indian Ocean world generates at this moment. Yeah. Right, well, that's a very nice segue into um, our next um, kind of uh, panelist uh, and what she has to say today. Um, this is Vani Saraswati, and Vani is the Associate Editor and Director of Projects at MigrantRights.org. Um, she's put together this wonderful collection of narratives from, of migrants called Stories of Origin, about the invisible lives of migrants in the Gulf. Um, she moved to Qatar in 1999 and has worked for various uh, local and regional publications. Um, and she's in fact launched a number of Qatar's um, um, leading periodicals during her stint here. Um, she's also, of course, been a grassroots community um, organizer, helping migrants in distress. Uh, she report, has reported regularly on human rights issues in Qatar for publications um, you know, here as well as in India. And since 2014, in this role in migrantsrights.org, she's been reporting from different Gulf states and also their countries of origin, um, organizing advocacy projects, uh, human rights training sessions, uh, targeting um, the employers, embassies, recruiting agents, um, businesses in Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, um, the Emirates, um, and she's been working with, with nationals and long-term residents in these countries also to kind of, um, kind of look at the different stakeholders and see how they can be brought together. Um, one of, of the interesting and kind of really important uh, kind of areas of focus for Vani um, are female migrants, uh, you know, including domest female domestic workers, um, and uh, really bringing issues of domestic work, especially women's work, into the mainstream, as it were, um, as far as our understanding of migrant labor is concerned in this region. Um, MigrantRights.org is, of course, one of the few um, bilingual or multilingual kind of um, advocacy platforms within the GCC and the different um, corridors of migration that, are, that kind of intersect here um, from Asia and Africa. And um, Vani, of course, is, is now herself um, bi-local or multi-local as she moves between uh, Qatar, the other Gulf states, and, um, and India. And, and really, uh, she really has been, um, uh, you know, she's been, has varied kinds of experience that I think, uh, you know, will really dovetail nicely with Malini, what you were um, talking about as well. So over to you, Vani. Thank you very much, Ade, and uh, thanks, Malini, for your insights. And I'm really looking forward to the book. It's such a catchy title, Jungle Passports. Uh, yeah, I'll be sure to book it in advance. Um, I just want to talk about the organization, right? The reason it was started about 15, 16 years ago, long before I joined them, by this young Bahraini uh, called Esra, her name is Esra al Shafe. And the reason that she uh, started migrantrights.org, which is under the umbrella of Middle East youth. So there are various verticals under this, including on uh, LGBTQ rights. But the idea around migrants and migration was there's this xenophobic um, narrative around migrants and migration in the Gulf. And the media, as you know, uh, in the Gulf isn't very free, the local media, though we do have Al Jazeera in the region, 
uh, reporting on local issues across the Gulf uh, tends to be limited. And when there is reporting on the Gulf, um, there's this whole victim perpetrator narrative or criminalizing of migration. So the idea was to collate this and to counter it uh, as a blog. But over the years, it has developed into a reporting and research portal. Um, and we kind of divide our work into different streams. One of it is the journalistic reporting we do on violations on what's happening here. The other is the analysis of the laws of the legal reforms or so-called reforms that do happen across the region and also comparing trends, right? Sometimes um, until recently, I think until the blockade, the Gulf states tend um, preferred working in sync with each other. So no one would push the limits more than the other states could catch up. So they were in sync. Since then, it's kind of loosened and which is a good thing, I feel. Um, and then, of course, the uh, grassroots work we do, where we engage with different stakeholders, um, not just migrant workers, but the businesses that employ them, the individuals that employ them, governments where they are open to it, uh, embassies of sending countries, recruitment agents. So we try to kind of have these conversations with them first, understand why they, why they think it is profitable or right for them to behave the way they do, and then you know, uh, try to break that down and see how we could introduce a rights-based approach to their work. Um, in all of this, our intent has always been to not attack individuals in the states, in, in the Gulf states, or criticize the government, but not really attack it, um, because we still have to continue working. Our, our team is all based there. The idea was to change people's behavior and attitudes towards migration and migrants. And we see that happening over the years. You know, to have that conversation on why do you feel that this is a bad thing for you personally, for your community as a whole, for your country, what are the benefits? Just having these conversations at various levels. And I think what we, um, when I say we, I mean people like me who are migrants, but with social capital and privilege and various active, uh, you know, uh, NGOs and international organizations or even the academia, what we failed miserably is in the storytelling of migration in the Gulf. The storytelling of migration in the Gulf is now all about migrants without a choice, without enough education, desperate, coming here to work. That is just one part of the truth. It's just one tiny fact in a far larger truth. Um, and that story is never told. But you'd hear in you know, private discussions, you would hear in, um, in, in, in small seminars where people won't go on record, where they'll talk about this experience over the decades. I worked for a Qatari um, a, a publishing firm and the owner of the Qatari for, uh, firm, the Qatari, would tell me about his experiences as a child in the 50s, or late 40s, in the 50s, and how he viewed India, for instance, or about the ships that came in from India on the way to Europe would get rid of grain or a food that was gonna go bad. So they wanted to reduce the load on the ships and they would throw it and how people would swim across to drag it in. And then the kind of interactions they had with the kind of people who lived there from the subcontinent um, in Dubai or in Qatar or in Oman um, you know, what, those, what that social fabric looked like and how even then um, people from outside of these countries, because also keep in mind, uh, these borders within the Gulf are quite new, are relatively new. Um, so the free movement of people within those regions and also movement of people coming in from British colonies to work here. All these stories don't find a place, right? We are not hearing these stories. Every now and then you would hear something about a Yusuf Ali from India or, or you know, uh, the relationship that certain people have. It's a little better, I think, in Oman because there are uh, people from the subcontinent who are naturalized, who are you know, in positions of power, even in the government. So you find it a little bit more in Oman, but all of these country, other countries are so eager to disown that story, to disown that story of where the relationship was more equal, was more give and take, right? that doesn't go with their current narrative that that is in conflict with what they want to express now 
which is we are the good people willing to give any number of job opportunities for people who don't have it in their home countries, primarily from Asia, increasingly from Africa, East Africa particularly. So that is what they want to stick to. They, they want to completely disown a period when, you know, uh, migration was both ways, that a lot of people here studied in, um, in the subcontinent. That's where they went to, or they went to Cairo, or they went to Damascus. These are the places that they went to for their knowledge, to build their skills. They don't want to acknowledge that because that will change the power dynamics. So this is in general about, I feel, a failure in storytelling that has led to this kind of really, uh, you know, a polarized discussion on migration. The work that we do, as I said, is to try and bring back a little bit of the storytelling. But again, given the organization's um, intent and the resources, it is still around labor migration. It's still about human rights exploitation. We try and introduce other aspects, it's limiting. So we really need to see how to bring that in so that, you know, as Uday mentioned, it's about human mobility, not just about migration. But this is, we are at the moment in a scary uh, period. And I know everybody says this about the period they've lived in. But if you look at how the global compact on migration is being designed, or the role of the UN Business and um, Human Rights Working Group, who is being held accountable? Should in the States be held accountable? Why are businesses playing such a huge role? Because as big corporations expand, it's colonialism, right? All over again. And they are now dictating terms, be it at the GFMD, uh, be it at the GCM through the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, or be it in different uh, other forums. So how do we now try to bring that back about the people and their right to mobility, and not about corporations and their need for labor, or about governments and their need for control and security, or how all of this should be discussed in a more open way instead of in silos. I'll stop here and then we can continue the discussion later. Fantastic, Vani, and this is great work that you're doing, um, not individually, but also as an, in the organizational sense. Okay, we'll move on to our third panelist, uh, Abdul Rahman Varsami, and we'll, of course, we'll reconvene and we can kind of talk to each other because obviously we're raising interesting um, kind of overlaps between uh, the different kinds of work that uh, you're all doing and, uh, you know, the, the places um, that you're kind of um, coming from here. Um, Abdul Rahman is a journalist at Al Jazeera English. He's also a producer in the newsroom, um, originally from Somalia, but he's been He's been everywhere. He's uh, in Australia, in the US, in Egypt, and now in Qatar. Um, but he's reported extensively in the, Indian, in the Indian Ocean world in terms of the Gulf um, Africa connection. He's been reporting extensively from Somalia, from Sudan, from Yemen. Um, he's, of course, also um, worked in, uh, primarily on um, human rights issues, um, the right to food, for example, um, and within Al Jazeera's um, human rights and liberty department. And I think um, you'll find that uh, a number of the concerns that you're raising um, from Australia, Singapore, um, from India and other, and other places um, further east of here, um, they really also come up um, and, um, you know, along with a special set of concerns that are specific to the Horn of Africa and its relationship to the Gulf. So, okay, over to you, Abdul Rahman. And me to myself. Hey, uh, Thank you, um, Oday. Uh, really nice to be with you guys. Um, um, this is a really interesting topic at the moment, and I think the, this region is generally very dynamic. But let me say the region that I am very interested in is uh, East Africa, um, um, going into the Red Sea, uh, Yemen, and then uh, the Gulf. Um, even though these places seem that they don't have a lot of population, actually the population is huge. You're talking about Ethiopia, which even though landlocked, its only access to the sea is the Indian Ocean and uh, the Red Sea. And that's about 100 million people already. Um, so this region is, um, as you guys said earlier, um, uh, been interconnected and, uh, you know, migration has been going up and down for a very long time. But it's, it's, it has received a lot more interest now from major powers in the world uh, since the piracy uh, around the Somali seas. Lots of navies came through. 
And uh, suddenly the world has realized that, you know, all these huge shipping that goes from Asia has, you know, distant to Europe has to go through the Red Sea. Um, so suddenly you have uh, military bases, uh, you've got the French, you've got the Americans uh, and the Chinese in, in Djibouti. You've got uh, the war in Yemen that is largely about control of ports. Um, and you've got these bodies of seas uh, that people on the side of East Africa and Yemen um, and Saudi Arabia um, specifically, but also other Gulf regions connect. Um, so at the moment, there is a lot of, I mean, you could say that always, as uh, Vani said earlier, that of course you could always say this, this era is, is a special one, but certainly one huge change that is, is happening is the last several decades of oil boom in Saudi Arabia, that is, uh, Saudi Arabia is the largest in terms of the number of migrants that it takes, uh, or could take, um, is now coming to an end. Uh, it's, it's, we, COVID-19 has exposed a lot of that. Um, and that has led to a number of issues. Uh, you've had uh, xenophobia against uh, lots of uh, the uh, migrants, particularly Ethiopians in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. This has been a big thing. Um, but just to, so, so basically you've, you've got a number of different sort of migrations you have to look at, uh, different areas. One is uh, just labor, people who are coming to do whatever work they can get. Um, and in the Gulf, uh, Ethiopia, for example, most of the migration from Ethiopia would be that, most of it. Um, you've got uh, places like Kenya that has uh, contributed a lot of uh, sort of technical, more technical. They do a lot of lower labor as well, but mostly technical. They be more like similar to the Philippine, uh, you know, uh, workers here. So they would be nurses. They would be working hotels. They would work in sort of uh, um, sort of technical roles that they've studied specific things, and that's what they do. But at the same time, that's going on. You have a war in Yemen. Um, the migration that was going from Ethiopia through Somalia to Yemen uh, was massive. We're talking about in 2018 or 17, there was about 100,000 people that crossed the Red Sea from Somalia into uh, Yemen. Um, the vast majority of them Ethiopians. Um, and th those Ethiopians mostly come from the Oromo uh, region. Um, and since, you know, in the last couple of years, you've had a massive protest movement in Ethiopia that is changing the entire country now. Uh, so at the same time, you're seeing a uh, buildup of military bases, certain places where there's conflict, um, but also you're seeing uh, some hopeful signs. You've got this huge dam that's being built in Ethiopia that is supposed to transform, you know, how people live uh, in that region and, you know, uh, availability of certain way of development. So the big, the big question is, can this region stabilize? And then of course you go up to Ethiopia, to Sudan, where you have protest movement that also wanted to change the nature of the state and government there. So you've got, so my couple of questions, one, how long would it take for this region to stabilize? Um, it, it's a, if, if that happens, that will mean a lot for the kind of migration that goes in between uh, the regions. Um, how long would it take for Saudi Arabia? Um, Saudi Arabia's economy is now in, in, in trouble, not your usual recession and then recovery. Uh, the problems are structural. The problems are, you said that you're going to get away from oil and now you cannot do that. Smaller Gulf states like uh, Qatar, like UAE, and have a lot more money uh, simply. And, and you know, this, this prosperity that they're going through clearly looks like it's going to go on for a long, longer while. But Saudi Arabia, which takes the largest number of, of migrants, is, is having serious issues uh, with the, that economy. The, problem, the fact that they have a problem and the fact that now the government is taxing people is creating a lot of animosity against migrants. So all the issues that people face, they will say, well, it's the migrants and uh, you know, let's get rid of them. Um, and that is also going into, so the one, so the migrants in Saudi Arabia, you've got 
the people that come for work, in the, you know, with contracts and so on. You've got lots of people that come through, you know, these 100,000 people that I was talking about a year that was going from Ethiopia to Yemen, they were going on foot and going, uh, and they don't have papers. And then you've got the long-term uh, population. Um, in, in Saudi lingo, it's called, they called Barmawi. When they want to insult them, they, they say, uh, these are the leftovers of Hajj. And this is a huge community. You're talking about people from Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and Somalia and, and, and you know, all sorts of different places. And now there's a lot of heat against those people saying, well, why would they? And these have been, they have been um, in Saudi Arabia for generations now. So some of them, three, three four, five generations. Um, and of course, there's no solution to them. You can't send them back home. Uh, because they're not your regular migrants, you, you know, they don't have papers. You can't, you can't just dump people into countries they've never been into. Um, it's sort of similar to the issue that um, other Gulf states, particularly Kuwait had, which is the Bidun people who have no papers, except in the case of Saudi, of Saudi Arabia, it's a lot more diverse group of you know, people. So um, I'll stop here, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting kind of dynamic that is happening of conflict, prosperity, you know, a hopeful, hopeful prosperity in, in some places, but also um, decline in terms of uh, uh, economy of, of particularly Saudi Arabia. Right. And also, well, that, this is very enlightening. And I think we, you kind of see the, the range of, of views and, and but also the overlaps between what three of you are saying. And I wonder if maybe we can do a, a quick round before we get into Q&A, we get a quick round of kind of responses perhaps to each other. Um, and maybe we start again with Malini and go to Vani and then finally um, to Abdul. Uh, you, I think we need to unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, my apologies for the confusion. So we, we really got three very different registers of the Indian Ocean region. And I think all the three registers are very important in a sense because they challenge the very taken for granted conventional uh, understandings of mobility in this region. Uh, I want to, I want uh, to kind of push uh, Udoy a bit to, to reflect on this region as a kind of a, um, you know, geostrategic site uh, that is also a center of hydrocarbon. That's a node in all these very important uh, shipping traffic. So if we think about the, uh, you know, the infrastructures of mobility, we think about the logistics that support trade network, that think, uh, if we think about the kind of nodes that support specific configurations of power, you know, and that was very clear in the kind of reflections that you had on Yemen, or you know, the kind of movements uh, in in also a, uh, in a in a religious sense of that term, you know, and questions of belonging that Vani raised, you know, in terms of uh, a complete reversal in a more equitable uh, passageway between countries and then you have the emergence of oil and you have this entire uh, resurgence in strategic and economic importance. You have this entire region being remapped in a way that you have very specific nodes of power and those nodes of power again influence uh, you know other constellation of labor flows and they completely uh, wipe out, illegitimize the kind of uh, pirate based and the other kind of seafaring journeys that you were speaking about in East Africa. And then Uda, you raised the provocation about a post hydrocarbon world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so now we are in a, in a kind of a productive tension between a region uh, that has had subterranean resources, uh, that has led to certain inf infrastructures of mobility and control, and the imagination of what a post hydrocarbon world would look like. So, you know, I'm going straight back at you 
before uh, Vani. Uh, yeah. I really wanted to invite you also from where you are at this moment, you know, mm -hmm. you combine both anthropology, but also, uh, you know, political science and strategic thinking in that yeah. sense. Well, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, if I were to jump in and make it, it's good to have a conversation like this. I think uh, you're absolutely right. The shipping and logistics are two very key processes along with human migration in this region. And uh, the mobility of goods and capital along with people who are also, of course, moving around um, various kinds of commodities. Um, I think this is really important. And, you know, Lalek Khalili has written a very fine book on this and how, um, you know, and this, especially given what happened in Beirut. Um, and really, if you really understand why um, this particular um, kind of uh, ammonium nitrate was even there, um, you have to understand the politics of shipping and why this ship, which was coming from Ukraine, from Odessa, was seized at this port. This is a really, but you, I mean, it's not exactly in the Indian Ocean, but I really do think that we need to start thinking about the Red Sea and even uh, the connections further on with the Mediterranean, um, because the way in which the Indian Ocean is kind of a global Indian Ocean today, it's no longer, um, you know, just confined to the countries around the, the basin because of air travel and because of various other reasons. Um, and I do think that the nature of global capitalism itself forces us to understand why in Yemen or in Djibouti or in Beirut, we end up with these kinds of situations. Um, and you, and uh, what then constitutes piracy? What is seen as legitimate accumulation of capital and what is seen as illegitimate accumulation of capital, right? What is the commodity? Are the laborers commodities? Uh, are only food uh, supplies, uh, you know? So these are really existential questions. There is also another aspect which is peculiar to um, um, the Arabian Peninsula, which is has to do with food security, um, that uh, this is not a place where um, you know there is they've achieved a green revolution or a food sufficiency kind of revolution. So there are various kinds of logistics, and I would include labor here, that must necessarily come through the circularities of the Indian Ocean, and so they must always be. Um, kind of controlled and regulated and managed, even in a post-hydrocarbon world. It is not a world where there, there, are very, there is a very large private sector. So the nature of capitalism is really a kind of state-managed one. And um, you have to understand this, uh, this has to do with the flows of commodities, including labor, um, and also, of course, um, you know, everything that is related to the demographics, the immigration, residency rules, and all of these other aspects, more political dimensions that are more visible to people who live here. Um, this is all really connected with the nature of the of the region, the political ecology of the region, and the and how it kind of shapes its political economy. Um, so I, I'm just going to stop there, but I do think that um, uh, there's obviously a lot more to say um, in terms of uh, the post hydrocarbon. Um, and the transition that is being kind of hastened by COVID-19, that we are being, uh, what was once seen as 2035, 2040, you know, that's where we need to be. Um, the, there's a kind of a history speeded up uh, in the pandemic. And we are now starting to think of much lower oil and gas consumption in, other, in the countries that buy uh, these resources. And of course, this has all kinds of implications for employment and for um, salaries and benefits in this region. And of course, as you see in places like Kuwait and Saudi, as Abdul was saying, that you um, have backlashes against um, migrant workers, including those who are in the public sectors. Um, and the, whatever uh, losses in revenues, oil and gas revenues that are being experienced now in these parts of the world um, are ultimately going to be recovered from non-citizens. I think there's yeah. no doubt about that regardless of the particular uh, place and the class hierarchies of these places of these societies but they are going to be uh, it, you could be working in Qatar Airways or in um, a major petroleum company um, uh, as much as a domestic worker or a construction worker uh, there is a kind of precarity vulnerability that at this point people experience and I think that uh, this uh, is something that has to be is the interruption of livelihood projects of various kinds of right to mobility um, I, I think ought to be linked to the current pandemic crisis.
sorry, that's it. Uh, we'll go, we'll go to, do you, did you want to respond, Malini, or we'll go to Vani? Vani, Vani, I would like to hear. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, though I must say, Uday, the recovery of these losses, uh, yeah. it's very much a PR stunt to say it's going to be recovered from non-citizens. Yeah. Because what the investments made in non-citizens in terms of social welfare, yeah. or even in terms of salaries, is far, far less. These yeah. governments are not brave enough because these are not democracies, there are no taxes, not brave enough to tell their citizens they're going to withdraw it from you. They're doing it in very subtle ways. So I think that's yeah. something to keep in mind. Right. And uh, something that Abdu said earlier about the Bidoons, I just want to say the Bidoon population is pretty large, even in places like, um, you know, Saudi and the UAE and uh, to, not so large, but it's there in Qatar as well. It's just, I think the Kuwaiti Bidoons have become more vocal and they've managed to, with, like a lot of things in Kuwait, the civil society, uh, we may not always agree with their stand, but they're vocal, which is such a good, a good thing. Um, and I want to also go back to food security, and I'm so glad that that came up, because what we, we hear a lot of uh, outrage when Qatar is buying uh, the shark, or they're building shark in London, or if they are buying up half the buildings in Paris, or the UAE is investing in a football club. There's so much outrage from the global north about the Gulf states buying stuff in their land, right? But when it comes to food security, especially in countries where they do not have strong policies, like in India, I, if I'm not mistaken, you still cannot just outright buy agricultural land. You can buy the goods from that or lease certain things, like you can't just go buy a sugar mill, you need to lease it. And it's similar in Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but a lot of other countries, be it Vietnam or Cambodia or even Sudan, the Gulf countries have gone there and bought outright paid farmers who for generations, for centuries, have been landowners tilling their own land, sustenance farming. They've given them a pot of cash and taken that away from them and they are not equipped to do anything else, driving them within a generation into penury, whereas that wasn't the case earlier and the governments are not doing anything. So it's Again, a different form of colonialism where Gulf countries to meet their food security needs are going and making these kind of, I wouldn't say investments, purchases. Um, and we need to like really look out for that. And in terms of routes, you know, shipping routes, uh, both Ma Malini mentioned that and Abdul was talking about Red Sea. Who's investing in Red Sea projects? It's Saudi and UAE primarily. Like millions they pump into the pro all the projects in the Red Sea area. And then who's building the rail route from Ethiopia to Djibouti for the harbor access? Completely owned by China and they don't even use local labor. So you have to start questioning, what do these investments mean? If these investments are supposed to help build these countries, then the least you can do is use local labor. Have it managed locally, work as investors, but that's not the case. You're seeing all kinds of stuff that um, I mean, when I go to these places, I'm going there to speak to potential migrants or returning migrants. My focus is something else, but all of these things are jarring and I don't have the complete comprehension on what it means politically for Saudi to spend so much there or for UAE to have such an influence in any of the East, in, in Horn of Africa. So I think we need to start looking at that um, and how that then translates to um, a, a mobility. And just one more thing about belonging, which both of you did bring up um, this, you know, third generation children, my own kids who were, who thought of Qatar as home. And so I had to quickly remove them from there. I didn't want them to think of it because it's never going to be reciprocated. Um, but then you see the, the social anxiety of people who were born there, who you know, get married to people there and live there. And these are from, you know, it's such a diverse population from across the world. And they don't have a route to any kind of permanency there. If they lose their job, they're thrown out. And it, the current political um, changes and, you know, realigning of allies, when you look at it, you also have to start thinking about the Palestinians in the Gulf, for whom this, for generations, this has been home because their home is no longer accessible to them. And then they're seeing a change in the political systems 
where they're too afraid to even own up to that belonging, either in the Gulf or back in Palestine. So what does that mobility look like? Because we are seeing an increase in refugees. The Syrians who worked in the Gulf for generations, for decades, what are they now? They can't go back. So are they refugees or are they labor migrants? Where is this overlapping? There are so many questions that we need to start asking and also kind of push Gulf governments, not bilaterally, because bilateral agreements are such a danger uh, on, uh, for human rights, right? Because they just decide, okay, so we have a good deal with India, we'll treat the Indians better, and then we're gonna like treat people who come from Sierra Leone like shit. So this cannot be, um, sorry for my language, but this cannot be the case. And I think we need to try and look at bilateral agreements only as an interim arrangement mm -hmm. until such a time we have a, at least a multilateral or regional um, thing. So that is in terms of belonging. Uh, it's not a right. question, but I just wanted to address what you all brought up. Absolutely. That's great. And you know, I think Abdul would definitely have something to say about China and the Red Sea and East Africa, because this is something, one of the points that he wanted to talk about as well, uh, along with the Saudi UAE uh, kind of investments and the logic behind it. But uh, just one before we go to Abdul, I just want to suggest to all the people who are, um, um, uh, who want to ask questions um, of, you know, this is your opportunity. There's a Q&A um, thing right at the bottom of your screen. So, you know, type out your questions and you know, we'll, we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. All right, over to you, Abdul. Um, we'll need to unmute you, sorry. Yeah, so many, so many great points uh, actually uh, raised. Uh, the thing about the um, Gulf, I'll say two, two things. One is the one about the Red Sea. Uh, there has been, so after 2010, um, after the whole piracy thing, uh, it's, it was a very important thing, particularly for the UAE to have sort of control over the Red Sea. And they, they took uh, control over the port of Djibouti and eventually uh, the war in Yemen was, a lot of it was about taking control of, of, of Aden, Socotra and other uh, uh, parts there. What it seems so far is that UAE is not very interested in developing those parts. What it is, was interested in is making sure that it don't, they don't develop because that would, of course, be a problem for Dubai itself. Um, as time went, big powers came in and uh, UAE is being muscled out of most of that. So they've been kicked out of Djibouti. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia never had really any any proper strategy, really. They, they were hopping from one place to another. The blockade also created this, uh, you know, different Qatar and, and, and Turkey working together. So they have been on that. So Turkey has a base in uh, Mogadishu. Um, they have, uh, Djibouti government was asking for the Turks to have a base in, in Djibouti. Um, so that's just a matter of time. If you go a little bit up, through the Red Sea, there's a little um, island called Suakin, Sudanese, um, Sudanese island that was going to be taken over by Turkey and so on. Um, but now you also have massive strategic issue for the United States. So in the Senate, the, the US spoke about how they're really unhappy and wary about the Chinese coming in into Djibouti. Chinese are building the railroad, but also they're creating a massive economic zone uh, around that area. Um, and it's actually very interesting because a lot of it, lots of it is not about only selling Chinese goods in Africa or um, actually there is a lot of Chinese in Ethiopia, for example, who are just leaving Ethiopia and work in Ethiopia and say farm and then sell it to Ethiopians. Um, so you, you, you're getting a lot of, so a lot of it depends on, of course, what happens in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a huge country, 100 million people, but it's going through uh, a lot of difficulty. So, I mean, there's a lot happening, but I don't think Saudi Arabia and UAE or even the Gulf region is able to control that area. I think it's uh, now big, big powers are coming in and, and those that are very interested in uh, what is interesting is how they are trying, I mean, the focus seems to be, there can be war on either side of the Red Sea, but let it not touch the Red Sea itself. 
so there is Somalia is completely collapsed. Uh, Yemen is almost completely collapsed and it's war, but the Red Sea trade should not stop. And, and it, so it kind of, it's just a bit difficult to see that these countries are not interested in necessarily uh, ending the conflicts, but they are very interested in making sure that the trade uh, on the Red Sea does not, does not change. Now, that could change um, if, if things really go bad in Yemen, that could spill out onto the Red Sea. You could have piracy on either side of Somalia and Yemen. Um, and there is no guarantee that, that that's not going to happen. I just want to quickly to talk about uh, some of the issues that Rani had uh, uh, talked about, about the, you know, how do people feel about migrants uh, in, the, in the region? Uh, correctly, Oman is very different. Oman you know, is a place where actually they accept as people that they are multi you know, have backgrounds and so on. In the rest of the Gulf, that's not the case. The most pressing issue is, is the people that have been here for generations. Um, and in the Gulf, there is, you know, uh, because of the political systems, you're not having a conversation about what to do. And they're not uh, accepting the UN, you know, kind of uh, guidelines about making people stateless or, or, you know, uh, migration and all of that. And th there's no path to citizenship. And, and it's, it's not um, cleverness or anything like that. Uh, it's not even a thought out thing. I mean, they need labor. And you have all of these people that are actually part of your society that you could uh, uh, you know, naturalize if you want to. But they don't have that. And they don't want to face it. And they don't want to talk about it. And it's, it's harder for countries like Saudi Arabia because the population is huge, poverty is increasing, they have lots of problems, but it's not really that difficult for Qatar. It's not really that difficult for UAE. In fact, it could be net positive in the sense that you give these people priority in terms of you know, getting jobs and so on, because you've got a massive economy that you are not able to fill without uh, migrants. So it's very difficult to see how they're gonna get out of it without either someone taking decisions and saying, this is what we were going to do, uh, or having a conversation. Uh, but this is uh, a problem that is growing and growing and growing, and it's not getting a smaller. People, of course, you know, th th those populations are getting bigger. Um, there is a thing about people who get naturalized in, in some of the Gulf countries. Um, Qatar is one of them. Uh, you know, you, you kind of say, I am Qatar, therefore I am not what I, you know, my background at all. I will not acknowledge that background and, and so on. Um, that is not the case in, in Oman. And of course, there's a very good reasons why, you know, why that's the case. Oman is, is an old empire that already, you know, at some stage had Zanzibar as, as its capital. Um, but also you now having this issue of xenophobia and hate against um, workers. Some of the workers, it's easy, they can leave. But there are the workers who've been there for generations. And what are you going to do with them? And, and you're just going to have probably some sort of a, um, you know, nasty um, you know, human rights abuses against them. Uh, and I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we had one question already. And I guess, Malini, you, you answered it very briefly. And that, you know, but I guess what Deva Jyoti was trying to get at was this whole question of reverse migration, reverse flows of people. Um, and this has to do partly with employment opportunities. It might have to do with student populations, for example, in Australia, um, because of various social and ethnic kind of tensions there. Um, this is particularly true now with the Chinese, with Hong Kong, with all sorts of other things that are going on, which also implicate um, um, Australia. Um, and I, I was wondering, um, uh, of course, there's a reverse migration from the GCC states as well. Um, and I, so this is, the, this is the flip side of belonging, so to speak, um, right? And, uh, you know, when, you're, when you are kind of, whether for better or for worse, but you are kind of compelled uh, to go back to where you came from. And, and that's something that in the heyday of uh, globalization after the Cold War ended in the 90s and the 2000s, this was really not something that we'd contemplated. But this is very much the story of the last 10 years. And uh, as much as you, know, you have um, migrants crossing the Mediterranean to go to Europe and so on. 
right? And I wonder if uh, Malini or any of the other, you, were, you could speak to this question of reverse flows and multiple forms of circulation or circularity, um, which is one of the themes that, you know, in this group, we, we kind of really address. Uh, just a minute, uh, Malini, uh, yeah, we'll unmute you. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a very important question of reverse flows. Uh, I think if we just look at the, the exodus of, uh, you know, migrant labor from Indian cities back mm. to the villages, and if we think about, you know, how, uh, you know, this whole act of walking became so deeply political and the whole uh, pathway of this reverse flow was was nothing short of a humanitarian crisis, you know, to use uh, a terminology that should have been used to uh, actually address this issue. Uh, in other instances, you know, a reverse flow is not possible. Mm. And uh, uh, if you look at the predicament of uh, international students who borrowed large sums of money to study of, you know, in Australia or in the US, and in the US, they almost had their visas taken away. There was also the threat of them becoming um, completely illegitimate, you know, and illegal. Uh, if you think it, it generated a kind of a status, there was, it was not possible for a reverse flow to take place for students who had missed the flights. And in fact, a reverse flow should not have happened because it is the duty of those states who are inviting students to invest in the higher education economy to protect the interest of students. You know, there was a big uh, furor in Australia because, uh, you know, uh, students who were unprotected, students who didn't know what to do because they were running out of funds, you know, the hospitality industry suddenly shut down, cleaning services shut down. There was no employment for, uh, you know, casual labor for, a, for, for reasons of the pandemic. Uh, there was almost a, a kind of a quasi um, official circular that said you needed to go back to your home. Now, you have created an economy where the higher education system thrives on the presence of international students. You depend on them to generate your real estate economy. You know, they are tenants, they contribute productively, you know, by paying rents, by paying extremely high international school fees. And that generated a condition that was not really a reverse flow. It was a period of excessive waiting. It was a period of limbo. It was a period of status. Mm -hmm. So flow is extremely productive and generative when we think about you know, mobility as a to and fro process. Yes. But COVID-19 has generated new ways of thinking about uh, being stuck of, of, of a kind of a, you know, a completely paralytic way of being, you know. Yeah. And I think that is what we also need to think about if we, if we accept that COVID-19 is not just a public health crisis, it is far more than that. Yeah, there are forms of immobility that might be arising. <laughs> Um, about the reverse, uh, the reverse mobility, um, just um, Yemen was a very interesting one. There's uh, during the wars in uh, Somalia, lots of people went to Yemen as refugees, um, and then uh, now after the war in Yemen, lots of them are coming to East Africa um, as as refugees. Um, so you're getting sort of um, the point that uh, also before that was story, you know, uh, Vani, I think mentioned is how people viewed, for example, Indians, you know, a long time ago and how they view them now would be very different. Um, and, and that literally has happened to Somalis and Yemenis in the, in the past, southern Yemen and, you know, Somalia were very much interlinked. Um, and then once in the 90s, Somalis, you have large, large numbers of uh, Somalis go as refugees to Yemen. Um, the view of the Yemeni of the Somali was the refugee, basically, um, and no longer, uh, uh, you know, this interchange and intermarriage and all of that. Yeah. Um, and I think now it's happening the other way around as well. And and just on the top subject of, of refugees, uh, for this region that has so many conflicts, uh, it's very interesting that of course you don't have 
many refugees going from poorer conflict region countries to very wealthy, you know, uh, countries in the Gulf because there is no treaties of, of uh, to, to, you know, for asylum, for refugees and all of that. So people would rather go through Sudan, go to Libya and then go to Europe that way. Um, and of course, this came up uh, in a big way during the crisis with Syria. Lots of countries pointing out why are the Syrians coming to Europe when they when they have all these very wealthy Arab uh, nations uh, just next door. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, Lani. Yeah, I just want to um, touch upon the whole students thing, and we've seen this even in the UAE, uh, Malini, where UAE has education free zones and. Mm they allowed the students to work and they were not able to pay the fees. There were no jobs, they're stranded and they were, the universities just didn't help. Uh, they didn't allow them to stay on in the accommodation because they still wanted the uh, hostel fees even though the students were not able to, learn, uh, you know, to work. And the way the, they market the education and we did a report on this on the site, you all can have a look, is that they, the students are paying high fees and they market it as you don't have to pay the entire fees, you just pay one lot. And then with your salary, you can pay the rest, right? But they're not earning and they were still expected to pay. So we find, found this issue with students even there. And in terms of reverse migration, it's not always voluntary. Uh, yeah. The UAE, for instance, um, Indians and Pakistanis make up the majority in the UAE. Uh, UAE is the host to the single largest Indian group, right? world over. When the pandemic began, uh, UAE told India and Pakistan, if you do not, because they had closed their airports, they basically gave them an ultimatum. If they don't take their citizens back, they will change the bilateral terms and they're going to you know, have penalties. And they arm twisted these countries to take workers um, back to their own, you know, when there was, this is very early in the pandemic when nobody knew what was happening. So on top of everything else, India and Pakistan had to have these flights to bring the workers back and, all, and the workers had to pay for it. it exactly. wasn't, and it wasn't even uh, competitive airfares. It was double what they would have paid otherwise. So you had both governments, you know, not really fighting with each other, but making sure that the workers bore the brunt of it in terms of the cost and being in limbo. And then they would book a ticket, they're homeless, and you know, I, I can't even get into the range of problems that they face and the kind of help organizations like ours have to provide, from rent to medical and healthcare to food. Um, so it's, a, you know, what do you do? And this is the problem with bilateral arrangement, because now the government doesn't have a policy. The policy is all determined by whom they're speaking to. On the other hand, you have the group of, again, women, which I failed to speak about completely, is um, all of these countries issuing guidelines, even when they loosen the curfews and loosen the lockdown, saying domestic workers can't go out. Best of yeah. time, female domestic workers are not allowed outside. They don't get an off day. There's so much control over their mobility, their sexualization over you know, who they are and what they could do. And then on top of that, you have a public health issue and you're blaming the migrant workers for it. During the last Eid, UAE again said, people can go and socialize, meet in small groups of five or six, but domestic workers are not allowed to leave the house. Mm -hmm. So the employer can go meet their 10 different friends and come back with the infection, but the worker who's mm -hmm. already overworked doesn't get a break, doesn't get to leave the house. Mm -hmm. So you find on the one hand, the con either if they cannot control the mobility of the worker, they want them out. That's what we've seen in the pandemic. There's one question here that Abhijit has raised, if I could answer that. Yes. Um, so while we try to speak to the government and we, we are not registered in the Gulf, we, because then we will not be able to operate. We'll be under too much scrutiny and you know, things. So we've, as an organization, we are registered outside, though our team works there. So very often we have to hide in plain sight. We will make sure we do our work, but then try to connect with people. We want to connect with governments to the extent that we can, you know, file a complaint or ask for help, but we don't want in any way work with them where those lines blur and we are being controlled. 
Having said that, um, we do a bit more in a place like Bahrain or Kuwait or even Qatar. Qatar, because the ILO has a technical office, we kind of we work with them before and we tend to be a little easier. You never know what will happen. But um, since we are often criticizing government policies, it is better for us to have a buffer either in interacting with them as a coalition of other organizations so we have a strength in number or to interact one-to-one -one with a few middlemen in place um, because the, the civil society environment just doesn't exist in these countries and we have to play it so in each country we adopt a different way of doing it um, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, and there, there are a couple of other questions about Gulf migration. One has to do with the, with the question of xenophobia, which I think you addressed a little bit. And then there's this other question about mobility of, of, of uh, Gulf migrants within the host states and perhaps even between different GCC states, like uh, you know, moving from, say, Dubai to Muscat to Doha and so on. Um, and the question I want to read out because I think it's very interesting in the way it's phrased is, is high modernism in these Gulf states or Gulf cities, is it premised on an exclusionary logic of urban development with low income migrants, higher, higher income expats often defined in different racial terms and then wealthy uh, citizens spatially segregated within Gulf cities. Hmm. Um, I will, I will, that's, this is a very interesting one, and it's actually, um, COVID-19 has been very interesting in sort of exposing that. Um, the, the, the infection and how it was happening is, of course, it, it happened within, uh, in Qatar, for example, is a lot in the labor sector. Uh, so these are workers who live in their own accommodations and so on, and then you had uh, the infection in, within countries and infection within expats all happening separately um, because these three groups don't necessarily always socialize. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the labor, uh, the laborers are completely isolated from all of these other groups. Um, and then uh, within countries, you've got a larger number of people who are domestic workers. You're talking about, uh, you know, maids and drivers and also um, nurses that work with them. And then you've got the expats who also, you know, literally live somewhere else. Um, so, you know, when you see apartments, for example, in the Gulf, in, in Qatar, in Doha, apart, there are no Qatari families that live in apartments, simple as that. As that. And so just in terms of how the city is designed and where people live and where they socialize and what they do, uh, all of these things means people are infected entirely differently. And, and at the beginning, even though I don't know the exact details, but there was a lot of work that has been done to expose some of that was, uh, uh, you know, how the quarantine, the lockdown measures for laborers was different than the lockdown measures for everybody else. And uh, so, for example, the, met the metro was stopped. That impacted the loss of people, uh, but not necessarily the countries or the wealthier expats. So their mob mobility already, uh, you know, within the city is, is, is curtailed. So it's very interesting how this has exposed that actual difference in where people live, how they socialize, who they socialize with, and so on. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, I mean, yeah. I've, I've written at length about this, but one thing that we see is it's the ghettoization has increased and it's increased not only with the uh, approval of international organizations, but with their very suggestions and ideas. When I was first in Qatar in 1999, the area I lived in, um, I, I lived in Abdul Abin Thani area, which is now the Mishra Regeneration Project. So I would walk out of my apartment, there would be a Qatari house there, there would be Qatari businesses, there would be expats. The society, of course, there are only 400,000 of us right then, um, but the society was very different. And then you saw over the years in the name of re neighborhood regeneration program, they started destroying these very um, mixed use neighborhoods and started separating people where they said, and then they had town planning where they would say, these areas, you couldn't have bachelors living there. 
right? So you had to take them away. But so slowly the idea was, oh, we'll give them better housing, but the better housing is in the middle of nowhere, in very dusty environments, in porter cabins, and in labor camps, where labor camps should be ab absolutely abolished. I mean, this idea of uh, thousands, tens of thousands of men living together, so isolated, but working elsewhere. This is not a humane way of treating anybody, right? It's gotten worse over the years, I must say, because even till early 2000, um, and I feel this is one of the small um, negatives of what international advocacy that didn't understand local context resulted in, because it resulted in extreme ghettoization of lower income workers versus this. There was already, you know, so you would have areas like Mansura or Najma or Muntaza, these areas within Doha where you would have Asians living or Filipinos living with families, but you would have people from the West living in the Pearl or in Daphna area or West Bay area. So you have that discrimination as well, where people wouldn't even, at least the people from, you know, the center of the city would go there to work in West Bay, but the reverse thing doesn't happen. And mm. this has become more stronger and stronger. It is not this bad actually in other parts of the Gulf, what I've seen, I haven't been to Saudi, but what I've seen in Oman, what I've seen in Bahrain, what I've seen in Kuwait, or even in uh, uh, UAE, there is discrimination in housing, but it's not as pronounced as you see it in Qatar, because, because it's the richest country in the world, but it's poorest in terms of human resources. They try to kind of play up this richness of wealth by showing only the glitzy part of the world, and hiding everyone else in this really terrible housing. So the model labor cities that come and everybody is praising should not exist. Right, absolutely, absolutely. It really is a throwback to a much older period where there were these um, you know, labor camps for uh, some kind of barracks for war efforts, or you know, people were building war port cities and port infrastructure and so on in the, during the world wars. But this sort of thing really is, a, is really a 21st century phenomenon. Um, in the way it is being done with these very highly securitized um, kind of spaces. And uh, the, as you're right, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the lockdown really was very different um, in, um, you know, labor city and, you know, in Asian town and so on. And I think that uh, this is something to keep in mind, the, the, the various uh, new forms of um, immobility that are emerging in places like Doha. And I think Doha in this sense is representative. You see it in Singapore, you see it in, of course, in uh, India. Um, and, you know, and, uh, and so this is really something which we can kind of think about. And along with that, you know, as one of the questions uh, Ms. Abash was asking is about xenophobia, um, that, you know, the segregation, the spatial segregation comes with a, not just ethnic stereotyping, which may have been there earlier, but that people act in a certain way in terms of urban redevelopment, right? Mm -hmm. And so, the, so then it is no longer just a stereotype in people's heads, but there are people act on them in very definite ways. And so Mansura or Najma is a certain kind of space. It's reimagined as a certain kind of space. Musharraf is literally rebuilt from scratch, right? And this is, a, this is really the, the, in some ways, it's the oldest and the kind of the Medina, the central district of the, of the old city but it is now also the newest. And, you know, so these projects of urban redevelopment, they invariably move further in the direction of spatial exclusion and segregation. Yeah. Right. Um, do you want to, uh, other, other, do you want to ask, answer the question about the Swahili coast, you know, down to Tanzania and Mozambique and the connections that have existed with the Gulf, you know, a bit further down from the Horn? Um, yeah, I mean, in a, in a general way, absolutely. I mean, it's it's um, uh, Oman has been the, of course, the biggest link. Um, religion has been also another uh, major link. I think at the moment, um, what is very interesting is that lots of the um, Kenyans and Tanzanians that you see in the Gulf, uh, you know, coming to work, are not from the coast. Mm. Um, they're usually from other parts of the country. Um, simply because in the past several decades, development of, you know, of, the, of the, the areas of the coast has been uh, problematic. And also the kind of, uh, now the other sort of uh, unfortunate trend that is happening in the 
uh, northern part of the Swahili coast in uh, around Kenya and, and the space between Somalia and so so the so you get um, halfway through you know Somali coast all the way down is is part of the Swahili coast and they actually speak Swahili as well along those ports and then you go into Kenya Lamu you know uh, Mombasa and so on there has been a problem of course of safety as well you've got uh, uh, conflict with al-Shabaab that has been spreading into that area. So it's kind of halted in that way. But uh, the, there's the links uh, in, in two ways. One, you've got the Swahili communities in, in, in Oman. And then you've got the slavery, the you know, trade that has happened from that coast into the Gulf. Um, unfortunately, people in, in the Gulf were of uh, Ancestry, you know, a slave, uh, the whose ancestry went into slavery and so on, are not, you know, they 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 go through what we talked about earlier, which is to deny any of those links of the past. Uh, while in in the American uh, African Americans who have been around there for hundreds of years, a lot of them are now trying to seek back their roots in Africa. That is not the case uh, for um, uh, black population in the Gulf. They, they, they not, that's not an issue for them at all. Of course, they all fare different. Um, and Oman in this case is an absolute different case, complete. Uh, Omanis of Swahili uh, origins are still in, in contact with their, you know, uh, with their ancestry. They speak the language, Swahili, back at home uh, and uh, alongside Arabic. But you don't get that for any of the other regions. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's the kind of interest of the end. But but the, I think the unfortunate bit as well is that the Swahili coast, up until now, does not really benefit from those historical links with the Gulf economically. Mm. Um, uh, probably it, it has to do with the fact that people over there are not learning lots of the skills that are probably required or, you know, uh, prized here for Kenyans, uh, you know, working in hotels, nursing and so on. So you'll find most of the people that are here from Kenya are, uh, for example, are um, from the highlands. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get a lot of Tanzanians in the Gulf. There, there are now. And uh, it's, it's happening because of these bilateral uh, kind of relations. So you get a little bit more Tanzanians, but mostly here you get Kenyans and you get Ugandans, but not uh, Tanzanians. Um, I think Dubai would be very different as well. Um, Dubai as a trading place, Africa, you know, it's been very important to a lot to all of East Africa, but that's not really your regular labor. That's more people yeah. coming and buying and selling, you know, goods. Um, yeah. and that's very different. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, let's have uh, you know if uh, you know if you can in a minute or two. Uh, you know this, we we need to wrap up. So, but in terms of closing remarks, if you could um, just uh, outline or kind of delineate what for you are the most important questions uh, or issues, perhaps that are coming um, that that you know are going to take uh, place. You know, once we. Um, you know, once COVID is now here to stay, and even if, you know, whatever happens with vaccines and so on, you know, where you see things going in terms of human mobility um, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. So we can start with Malini, go to Vani, and then end with um, Abdul. Uh, you know, I want to be optimistic. Uh, mm. We all do. Yeah, but I'm failing. I'm really failing because I'm thinking about the spillover effects of uh, and the high, you know, the high dividends that that uh, labor migrants and here I'm including international students in this category mm -hmm. because it's also made clear, you know, they're not just student, high fee paying students, but they're completely dependent on an informal, quasi-formal, casualized labor market to make a living. So I'm concerned about the spillover effects. Uh, mm -hmm. I am extremely concerned about the kind of precarious labor that 
you know, even if I think of uh, the flow of construction workers to Singapore and COVID and the kind of impact, the ghettoization of workers, uh, I'm concerned that the kind of loans that people have taken, the kind of, uh, you know, mortgaging lands that they have done, COVID has interrupted uh, a labor journey which should have lasted at least a decade for any of the labor migrants, whether they're going to Singapore or to the Gulf or an international student in Australia to kind of even break even, you know? Right. So it concerns me that the spillover effects of, of uh, this kind of precarious labor is, even if it doesn't uh, lead to, uh, you know, status and immobility, it's going to have uh, a far long-term repercussion on the lives of people who are working in, in offshore countries, in countries where they are not citizens, where they are neither permanent residents, so they don't have any kind of these privileges that would get them access to social security. Very important mm. point that Rani raised. Uh, yeah. I'm also uh, noting and uh, noting how all the economies who have been dependent on this kind of a labor workforce to come and actually sustain their economies are all taking note, you know. Uh, US wants international students back. Australia wants international students back. They want Indian and Chinese students to come and pay the fees. So there is, there is a dialectic happening, but I, I, I am really concerned about the spillover effects um, yeah. of these transnational journeys. And this is, of course, also in addition to what we were, even before COVID, we knew was going to be a long-term impact of a post-hydrocarbon and kind of climate change fuel kind mm. of mobility that is, that is going to obviously affect the, all parts of the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, Vani. Um, I think one thing that's of major concern is we've seen uh, origin countries shirking their responsibility during the pandemic for their citizens were here. Mm -hmm. We've known forever that uh, the embassies are ill-equipped uh, mm -hmm. or unwilling to take up labor cases. Uh, they see themselves as trade mission uh, mm -hmm. to reduce the pro problems that their citizens might face for destination country, not so much to protect them. Except for Philippines, we haven't seen any of the other countries actively promoting the rights of their citizens working here. We've also seen say a country like Ethiopia or Nepal, investing a lot in outward migration because they're mm. not able to generate employment locally. So they've kind of set up all these policies, um, put in money, um, recruitment agents have put in huge amounts of money to be registered and their business has stopped. So what will happen when everything reopens? What levels of not just corruption, but costs, like Mali mentioned, the loans that workers under or have to take up if the you know the bribes and charges not even the fees the bribes and charges that they pay increase how are they going to be able to pay for it to migrate so this whole concern of, of and then we are seeing uh, the politics of sending countries changing as well right it is no longer focused on there is almost and we saw this when this whole um, internal migration a humanitarian disaster happened in India, the absolute lack of empathy for people who are impoverished and troubled. Why do they have to do that? So you see this whole political climate where there's lack of empathy for, for people who are in a bad situation, thinking that they are there in that situation out of choice, right? So my main concern is how are sending countries, whether they depend, like India doesn't depend on remittance, its GDP is far huger. But a country like Bangladesh or Nepal or Philippines or Ethiopia, they, they are, they're increasingly uh, looking at this as a way of getting out of poverty. How are these countries going to respond? Um, and how are, and the fact is hydrocarbon or not, uh, the jobs that migrant workers do in the Gulf, nationals are not gonna do it. So the dependency will continue. The fertility rates in the Gulf are dropping. So there's no way, it's not a temporary measure. It's just the dependency is going to, in fact, get even worse. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that recruitment is a profit-making endeavor for small businesses and citizens in the Gulf, which is never looked at when we look at recruitment reform. It's always this brown or, 
you know, a dark skinned per person somewhere else being really wretched to migrants. It's, you know, it's never this person sitting in the Gulf yeah. who's making money out of it. So this is one concern. The uh, second concern I have is um, we know that the Gulf countries haven't invested in um, public welfare schemes. So child care, elderly care, hospice care, none of this is really, um, they haven't really invested in it as a public welfare measure. You need mm -hmm. to pay for it. So in return, what they've done is made it very cheap and easy to recruit, manage, and control a domestic worker who will do all of that for you. You know, take care of your child uh, after school, take care of the elderly at home. So there's this one machine, you know, uh, and you're not going to treat them like a human. And they have complete control because also the system, they don't fall under the labor law in any of the Gulf countries. Either they have a separate law or they're only under the immigration law. So the dependency on domestic workers will also grow and there'll be more control because what you mentioned earlier about the hybrid system, right? So you're going to be working at home for a bit, working outside, a lot more remote working, which means the bulk of the work at home and the exposure to your employer is going to increase. So I, earlier domestic workers had a break, a few hours a day when the employers went out of the house. Now, it's, you know, they don't even get that break. They're at their beck and call 24 seven. So what does this mean? And there's a monopoly over domestic work, uh, living domestic work. So there is no other way in which you could do domestic work in the Gulf, except yeah. for a little bit in uh, UAE. Everywhere mm -hmm. else, the only way you could do it is as a living worker, only legal way of doing it. So we need to break that monopoly. monopoly. We need to change that because we know the dependency on domestic workers will only keep increasing as more health issues come up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, for me, it looks a little bleak also because other countries that have better policies are trying to move towards a Gulf model of labor <laughs> migration, labor, labor ma management. And um, that's a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Abdul, you have the ra last word. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, that was really interesting. But, um, I, I would just say uh, there, one, I think uh, state collapse is, is a big problem that nobody's trying to solve. So mm -hmm. Somalia and, and Yemen next to each other, uh, basically two collapsed states. Um, and, they're, and things are going to get only worse unless you are able to uh, get the state back together. But uh, it doesn't seem that that's possible because of the fragmentation that have happened. And combined, that, that's we're talking about 40 million people at least. Um, also, uh, what happens in uh, uh, Ethiopia, a, a large country that is going through all kinds of issues, which on which side do they land? Is is a big, big I think problem uh, to think about. I, and I'm hopeful. I think I think probably they you know, they'll get through it, and probably Ethiopia is going to be a bit more democratic, and you might have some development that happens in keeps a lot of people in, in the country. Uh, Sudan is going through this uh, uh, process. Um, and of course, there are forces like the UAE um, and Qatar and, and Turkey that are all somehow involved. Which way it lands would be very interesting because uh, Sudan um, can either survive or go to civil war. So uh, it's got lots of internal problems that could, that could uh, blow up. Um, and if that goes better, again, that would be good for the entire region in terms of trade, in terms of you know people, people you know being able to do something. Saudi Arabia, I think, is is other really wild card. Um, yeah. What happens to Saudi Arabia um, in terms of will it be ever able to um, sort of create a different kind of economic system? Um, now even the political system itself is is not very stable. There's there's issues around succession and all of that. Um, and, you know, what happens in Saudi Arabia in terms of economics does really impact that whole region. Uh, if you think about simple things like uh, livestock, for example, uh, Somalis, Sudanese uh, export massive livestock to these countries, uh, to Saudi Arabia in particular, because of Hajj and so on. So what happens there will be very interesting. And just the last thing is there's a big power sort of interest in that region. Um, what, what would happen? What would happen with China's interest, and US interest, and Turkish interest? Does that make trade better? Does that make you know, life easier for people? 
Uh, all of that, I think, will, 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 will be interesting. Um, lots of the uh, Yemen, the problem with Yemen also impacts countries like, you know, Ethiopia. People mm. who want to go to Saudi Arabia now have to go through a, a war zone that is Somalia and then cross the sea and then go through another war zone and then get to, um, you know, Saudi Arabia. So, so those are, uh, I, I am hopeful. I think lots of these things probably will, will land on the right side. But but it's an it's a huge change that is already happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm really thankful to all three of you for your time and to Taha and, and his student team to kind of put it all together, um, and our events team as well. As Zubash, I can see is 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 here, and uh, really this has been very very enlightening for me at least. And I hope uh, you guys you know it was it was the same and it was enjoyable apart from uh, illuminating. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for the message. Thank you very much. We'll put up um, uh, a recording um, now that we have your consent. We'll put